Now, and before we do that, let, let me just pray briefly. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have to be church in a different way today. And we pray now that as we think about your word and what you might be saying to us in these strange circumstances that we're in, that you will help us to hear your voice, to know your presence, to know your words of comfort, your words of encouragement and challenge and guidance. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Quite a few uh, people have said to me over these last few days uh, when I've been speaking on the phone and so on, um, how you can get up in the morning and look out of the window at the, the sunshine, um, the beautiful sunshine we've been having, the spring flowers and so on, and, and everything can seem so normal, can't it? Yet in other ways, we live in a strange land. The roads are so quiet, people step off the pavement to avoid you. I remember the first time that happened a week or so ago, someone stepped off the pavement into the road when they saw me coming. And I thought, wow, that's, um, that's a bit weird, not very nice. And now, of course, it's the norm. If you go out for your walk, um, people step off the pavements to stay two, two metres apart. We live in a strange land, don't we? And we may feel sometimes like strangers in it. We're mainly confined to one place, meeting only a very small number of people, if anyone at all. And we're worrying about things that we've never worried about before, probably most of us. Our feelings and emotions are strange and disturbed. Our hopes and expectations are constantly being recalibrated. The Olympics have been postponed. It's like summer is cancelled. We live in a strange land. In Psalm 137, the writer says, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a strange land? How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a strange land? And the context that that psalm was written in was the exile. Israel had been conquered by the Babylonians. Their land had been overrun. It felt to them like the ultimate catastrophe. Many of their people had been taken into exile in Babylon. And so in Psalm 131, they cried out, in the words um, popularized by Boney M, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of us. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a strange land? God's people sat and wept in disorientation and confusion. Why had this happened? Where is God? How do we live for God in this strange land? And how do we worship when we don't have a temple to go to? In fact, the exile turned out to be a formative experience for Israel. Some people think that the Old Testament, as we know it, was edited and compiled during this period. Of course, much of it had been written long before, but now it was shaped and combined with other writings from the exile itself. So these times in a strange land were also times of formation, also times of spiritual renewal, as well as of pain. So what's God calling you and me to be like in this strange land, in our strange land? What is he calling us as a church to be like? Today I'm going to look briefly at some lessons from the book of Daniel as we think about how to live in a strange land. Daniel lived during this period of exile and he was brought to Babylon as a young man to serve in the king's palace. Now, um, if you were here last week um, online in this service, you remember my amazing visual aids. Well, I haven't got any amazing visual aids this morning. I'd like you to participate and be the visual aids together, okay? Now, uh, kids, you can carry on with your drawing and stuff if you want to, but so I'm relying on the adults to do this. So I'm gonna give you three hand gestures that you've got to do to remember the three things I'm gonna encourage you to think about this morning. Uh, so the first one, uh, let me get you so that I can see all of you again. Uh, so can you all pretend to be eating, please? Yay, you are listening. So eating. So my first theme is around eating. Um, Daniel uh, was in a new situation and he had to decide in Babylon how to act. And in Daniel chapter one, we read how he was taken to the king's palace and he was basically being um, groomed, he was being trained to, be a, uh, to serve in the king's palace. And as part of that, they were expected to eat and drink a certain type of food, Babylonian food. And Daniel and his colleagues, this, this for them was, 
was really alien. They came from, a, from Israel where there was a lot of um, symbolism in what you ate. There was the concept of food, some foods being clean and some kinds of foods being unclean. And part of the way you expressed your devotion to God was in the way you ate. And Daniel made a really brave decision when he went to Babylon. And he said to the officials in the palace, sorry, I don't want to eat all your fancy food. I want to eat in a way that I would have eaten when I was in my homeland. I want to stick to a diet that's mainly based on vegetables, and I want to be allowed to do that. And he risked, he risked his life, probably, asking to do this. And if you read Daniel chapter 1, we haven't got time to read it all this morning, you'll see that it was agreed that he could do that. And it turned out that he ended up healthier than all the other people who were eating the Babylonian food. And the result was that people thought, wow, he must, he must worship an amazing God if doing this eating food to show his devotion to God um, enables him to, to be that healthy and strong, even though he's eating foods that we think are odd in Babylon. So da Daniel was in this new situation and he knew he had to set some boundaries, some good habits. He wouldn't be able to live exactly as he would have done in his homeland, in God's holy land, but nevertheless, he needed to work out how to honor God there in this strange land. And he focused on what he put in his mouth as a way to express his commitment to God. And it got me thinking about what are the boundaries that you and I need to put in place in this strange land we're living in. I want to be very practical for a minute. What are the practical things we need to do to help us live healthily and for God in this strange land? Like Daniel, there's some stuff we're going to have to do which isn't ideal. But if we refuse to do it because it's not perfect, that's going to be foolish. But there are other things we need to perhaps decide that we're not going to compromise over, like Daniel decided. Maybe it's literally about what you eat. It's very tempting, isn't it, in these days to comfort eat um, because we're feeling miserable or because we don't quite know what else to do. But for many of us, I'd like to suggest that it's more about how we feed our minds and our spirits. And for many of us, that means how we use our screens our computer screens, our phone screens, our, our, our iPads, and so on. We need to attend to that. What are we going to eat? What are we going to feed ourselves with in terms of what's coming through our eyes? How are we going to use our screens over the coming weeks? We're going to be using them a lot, most of us. Uh, some of us, you know, some of you I know who are at work are using them pretty much the whole time. You're there on your screen interacting on video conferences and everything. So they're great. Screens can be a great way to stay connected, as we're discovering this morning. But how can we make sure that we use our screens in healthy ways and not in unhealthy ways? Obviously, some things are out, aren't they? Some things are outside the boundaries, porn and so on. But there are other things which are greyer, which we might decide actually they need to fall outside the boundaries of what we get, how we're going to live to honour God and how we're going to manage our mental and emotional health in the days ahead. There are those social media gossip forums, which end up being negative and critical and divisive. Maybe you can go to those places and be salt and light there and spread God's love and grace. But maybe you find when you go to those places, you end up being negative and critical and divisive yourself. In which case, guys, time to unfollow, time to stop going to those places. Maybe we can easily get in the habit of using social media to feed our needs for affirmation and validation. We need to be careful of that. I must admit, um, I pretty much weaned myself off Facebook over the last six months. And now the last couple of weeks, I thought, actually, I need to go back on it. I need to go back on it and engage with people. But I've, I've noticed how, how it pulls you in. Social media draws you in. It starts affecting how you feel. If you need to keep going back and checking, you know, are people reading what I'm, I'm posting and all that kind of stuff. You can get really sucked in to unhealthy ways of behaving. So how are you feeding yourself? How are we feeding ourselves? Are there boundaries that we need to put in place? It's going to be down to us over the next few weeks. In the main, people are not going to be policing what we're looking at. It's down to us to honour God. And as Daniel discovered, when we honour God with our lifestyles, he honours us. So point number one, eating. Right, Daniel 2, uh, Daniel 2 is, a, is about the, the king's dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar was not a reasonable man. And he said to all his advisors, he said, I want you to interpret the dream 
But here's the catch, I'm not gonna tell you what the dream is. You've gotta tell me both the dream and what it means. And of course they were, they were horrified at this. And then the third catch was, and if you don't, I'm gonna execute you all. Not, not a great situation to be in. But Daniel came into that situation as one of the king's advisors. And he, well, he did a number of things uh, which, are, which are impressive. First of all, he said to all his colleagues, look, let's calm down, let's not panic, let's not rush here, let's ask the king for a bit more time. And then he arranges a prayer meeting. Uh, we read in Daniel 2, 17 to 18, then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And then God reveals his, the dream and the meaning to him. But Daniel doesn't get all um, you know, puffed up and proud about this. He immediately says to everyone, look, let's give the glory to God. God's the one who has revealed mysteries. God's the one who needs to be given all the glory. And that's what he says to the king as well. When the king, when he explains the dream to the king, he then says, um, this isn't about me. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. So my second gesture, can you all do this, is pointing and it's pointing upwards. Yes, let's have some pointing. Fantastic. You see, Daniel turned a potential disaster into an opportunity to point to God. Admittedly, if he hadn't, things would not have gone well for him. So he did have a motive, um, but he, he really used this opportunity to point people to God. Friends, I don't think we should underestimate the opportunity we have in these days to point people to the only place where true hope lies. Science and medical research are amazing. And we should give thanks to God daily for those who God has gifted in these areas, including some in our own church family, and for the amazing work they're doing. And we should pray for God to prosper and inspire the work, particularly as they look for vaccines and cures. But is our hope ultimately in science and in medicine? No, our hope is in the God who created science and medicine and everything else. We have this amazing opportunity, don't we, to come together as families and churches and communities to support and encourage one another. And that's wonderful. And we should work and pray for that to happen more and more. But is our ultimate hope in our families, in our communities, or even in our church? No, our ultimate hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of our church family. The British spirit is apparently a great thing. Comparisons are already being made with the Dunkirk spirit and the spirit of the Blitz and so on. Yes, the human spirit can be a great and inspiring thing. But is that where our hope lies? No, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit who is able to do things in people that are beyond our natural abilities and anything else that we could ever imagine. And as we share on these days over social media and phone calls and so on with our friends and family members, as some of us get used to being cooped up together with people that we might not have chosen all the time to be cooped up together with, how are we going to ensure that we keep pointing upwards. Not that literally God is up there, but I'm speaking figuratively. How are we gonna keep pointing upwards to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? How can we make sure that like Daniel, we always give him the glory? How we remind people that there's a God in heaven who can reveal mysteries? How, who, how can we show that our hope and trust is in him? In this strange land, let us point to the God who's not a stranger to us, but a good God, a God who's able to do far more than we can imagine or think. And perhaps some of us need to start by pointing ourselves upwards to God, reminding ourselves, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves of that too on a daily basis. And let's be expectant that God's going to work and do remarkable things in and through us, even as he did with Daniel. And if you flick across a couple of chapters to Daniel 4, we find that Nebuchadnezzar himself came into some sort of relationship with God. He had an experience of God. He gave glory to God as a result of Daniel's witness to him in a strange land. 
So we've had feeding ourselves, we've had pointing, and the final one, well, what do we think of when we think of Daniel? What's the, what's the famous story of Daniel? Yes, thank you, uh, bachelors. Uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, but I'm not going to encourage you to roar this morning. Uh, what was the thing that Daniel did that got him into the lion's den? Okay, I'm going to look for some faces. Yes, thank you. Yes, third jester. How did Daniel get into the lion's den? He ended up in the lion's den because he insisted on praying. How had Daniel ordered his life in a strange land? Well, we read in Daniel chapter six that he opened his windows three times a day towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees and he prayed. And nothing was going to stop him doing that, not even the threat of being thrown to the lions. How are we going to order our days in this strange land? The interesting thing is that Praying three times a day to Jerusalem, or just even praying three times a day, or getting down on your knees, none of those were things that Daniel got from his Bible. They were not in the Bible as Daniel, they were not in the law, the Torah, as Daniel knew it. It seems that this was a rule of life which he, and perhaps some of his other exiles, made up themselves. They thought, actually, how are we going to worship God? How are we going to order our lives in this strange land? Well, here's what we're going to do. Three times a day, we're going to get down on our knees and we're going to pray facing Jerusalem as a way of reminding ourselves and a way of proclaiming to those around us that this is how our lives are focused. It was a spiritual discipline that they adopted in their place of alienation and disorientation. It was something they decided to do. What will we do in the days ahead as we live in this strange land to ensure that we remain orientated towards God, that we lean on him, that we lean into him, that we place him at the very center of our lives, that we show ourselves and him and everyone else that he's the rock and cornerstone on which our lives are built. Yesterday, the, the deacons, we, we had an away afternoon. Um, it was on Zoom, so it wasn't quite um, the away afternoon that we had planned. Uh, but we were thinking about the kind of church, we, we were sort of dreaming and thinking, what kind of church would, would we like to be looking a few years down the line? And, and one of the things we thought about is, wouldn't, wouldn't it be awesome if at some point in the future we were able to look back on this period in our church life and in our national life. And if we could look back on this period and see this as a time in which actually God transformed us spiritually. Our prayer lives took off, our relationships with God and our spiritual health were transformed because like Daniel in a strange land, we decided to make God the priority. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be amazing? There's a, there's a phrase in um, one of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, they, the land had been through a very difficult time. The locusts had come, just as they're coming in East Africa at the moment. And God promised to restore to his people, and this is the, the phrase, the years that the locust has eaten. And you might be thinking, particularly if you're a young person and you're, and you're thinking, well, what's going to happen to my summer? What's going to happen to my exams? What's going to happen to my my university term and all the stuff I was looking forward to, we might feel figuratively that these are the days the locusts have eaten. We're just going to be left with nothing to show for these months. They're just going to be wasted months. They're just going to be pointless. We're just going to have to, the best we can do is get through them. But actually God says to his people, I'm going to restore the years the locusts have eaten. Wouldn't it be amazing if we look back on this time and we're able to see these as times that actually were times of great blessing, at times which prepared us as God's people, not just for now, but for the future. I'm gonna have, we're going to pause, uh, then I'm going to pray, um, then we're going to sing a song, and then I'll hand back to Steph and uh, she'll explain what's going to happen next. So let's pause, let's just reflect. Remember my three gestures, how are you feeding yourself? How are we feeding ourselves? Where are we pointing? And how are we ordering our lives? Let's just in the quietness, let's just reflect on that, maybe talk to God about it. Then I'll pray and then we'll sing a song together.
Dear God, we live in strange days and it feels like we're living in a strange land, but we thank you that this is not a new experience for your people and that we can look back at other experiences of your people recorded in your word and we can take encouragement and challenge from people like Daniel and the way they lived their lives in a strange land. We pray that you will strengthen us. You'll pray, we pray that you'll help us to take the practical steps that we need to take to remain emotionally and spiritually healthy in these days and that you'll help us to keep pointing to you and living our lives orientated around you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Well, thanks for listening. So we're going to hand back to Rob and we're going to sing a song.